I Hate the View, Episode 3. Mr. Reagan. Today I will be reviewing five episodes from January 21st through the 25th, and I can honestly report I still hate The View. So I'm one week behind because I was busy making Gillette parody videos last week, but I do plan to catch up. This episode of I Hate The View is particularly good because the ladies were particularly nasty and idiotic last week, and the more nasty and idiotic they are, the more fun I have ridiculing them. So as Chris Cuomo likes to say, let's get after it. Let's get after it. It wasn't until 68 that the vote for black people was given. Actually, black people got the vote soon after emancipation in 1870 with the ratification of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. Till 68. Till 68. Till 68. I think Whoopi's fake news here is actually a widely held misapprehension of history in America. People just don't know history, and Whoopi Goldberg is not helping the situation by perpetuating this myth here on The View. I was born in 1968, and I remember when I turned 40, My father said to me, do you know that you are the first person in my family to enjoy full civil rights? And it just, it sort of stopped me in my tracks and shook me to my core because he followed that and said, well, maybe. I actually hate when people tell stories like this. This is what we refer to as anecdotal evidence. This is the weakest kind of evidence anyone can provide. If one is trying to prove an argument, in this case, these ladies are trying to show that in America today, there is still inequity between white people and black people. And so Sonny Hostin tells this emotional story about her father, and this is supposed to illustrate the idea that there is still inequity in America. But one's perception may not accurately reflect society as a whole, especially when that society consists of hundreds of millions of people. My girlfriend and I were walking through Beverly Hills the other day, and she made a keen observation about the people in that town. They represented a broad spectrum of races. She turned to me and she said, if people really want to see how racist America truly is, they should walk around Beverly Hills. They should see all the black people here driving Mercedes and BMWs and Bentleys. Yes, I just used an anecdote to refute the validity of anecdotal evidence. Okay, fine. I'm not perfect. Nevertheless, my girlfriend was absolutely right. It's amazing to me to see the enormous wealth that some people have in America, including the women here on The View, and then I see those same people complain that there is this enormous inequity in America against them. It's ridiculous. Yes, there are a lot of poor black people, but there are a lot of poor white people, and those white people do not have the same legal advantages as any of the poor black people in America. They don't even have the same legal advantages as the rich black people in America. So is there inequality in America? Yeah, tons of it. Inequality just means that not everyone is equal, but that's okay, that's inevitable. We're all born different, we live different, we die different. The real concern is inequity. Equality is the state of things being equal. Equity is the state of things being just. We shouldn't ever strive for equality because that would force people down or into lives they don't want. We must strive for equity, that is, equal opportunity. That's the real goal, equal opportunity and more opportunity for everyone. The left confuses these things constantly. They believe that if everybody is not rich, grave injustices are being perpetrated. But this is not necessarily true, because even if everybody had exactly the same opportunities, there would still be inequality. And that's because not everybody wants to do what it takes to be successful in a competitive world. Capitalism and democracy, especially in America, have provided the best opportunities to the most people in history. And yes, that includes your family, Sonny Hostin. Look at your success and look at me. You're a black Puerto Rican woman, and you're doing a lot better than this privileged white male. So, you know, they gave all that land to white people, whether they were born here or not. And uh, besides the color stigma, there's also the financial uh, disabilities, you could call it, uh, that that black people have had to endure. So, and, and, you know, of course, he mentions the fact that people just see color. They just see color. And it was like, it seemed like it was a deliberate way to oppress a people. A very deliberate. It wasn't just accidental. They deliberately did not give land to those people. It's well, really, it's, it's the original that's... sin of this country. I really respect Martin Luther King Jr. I think he's awesome. And I wouldn't want to contradict him and what he has said. However, I will contradict Joy Behar because she is an idiot. None of these people seem to know anything about U.S. history. 
Joy, not every white person who ever immigrated to the United States was given land. Some people at certain times throughout the history of the United States were given land. None of my ancestors were given land. They all came to America too late for that. Joy is getting all worked up about this injustice, but that's because she's confused. She has a misapprehension of history, and then she's working herself up into a fury about this imagined injustice. Joy, go read some history books, and then maybe you can talk intelligently to your audience about what injustices may or may not have occurred throughout American history. So you just got your first DGA nomination? Ever. Ever? <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, it must be because he's black. So they have Spike Lee on the show, and I'm not gonna show that bit. Basically, he made this movie called The Black Klansman. It's your typical white people are evil and stupid and black people are awesome Spike Lee joint. They talk a little bit about how horrible Trump is, but there are no specific well-defined accusations. It's all just kind of like, we hate Trump, ha ha ha. Contorting their face into expressions of disgust, things like that. It's not worth showing. I think both the robbers and most of them are black. Oh, really? You think most robbers are black? Mm -hmm. You think we cause most of the problems, well, right? I'm getting everything from the news. What well, you, the news is bad. The news is like, no, what did you guys say, fake news? It's, fake news. Yeah, I think it's set up to keep people who look like me and you afraid of one another. Because as long as we're afraid of one another, we kind of are here. But if we ever start dialoguing and talking and kind of got to here, I think we will require the news to present the news differently. Well, you're probably right there, yeah. but I still think most of the shootings and robberies were done by black. <laughs> All right, so this guy's show is trying to ridicule this older lady. You can hear them all laughing at her. But the problem is that these people are just unaware of the statistics. According to the National Crime Victimization Survey in 2002, black people were 16 times more likely to be incarcerated for robbery than non-Hispanic whites. Robberies with white victims and black offenders were 12 times more common than vice versa. The problem is not that this old lady is misinformed or that she's some kind of a racist. The problem is you guys are just unaware of the statistics. All right, let's move on to the next episode. Well, you know, the great thing about the Oscars is you don't know who's gonna win. Yeah. Because, you know, as I, I, I think I've said this before about the nomination process, you know, we are nominating films for very different reasons than you go see them. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm a sound person, I'm going to listen for the sound to see if it's clear, if it's doing all the things it's supposed to do. Most people say, well, you guys never vote for the movies we vote for. We're voting for different things. That's why. Mm -hmm. It's not that we're ignoring it or we're not hip enough to know what y'all are saying. Mm -hmm. It is we are looking in our very special groups, you know, actors, directors, uh, sound people, hair and makeup. We're looking at the best <coughs> for that year in our craft. Nobody is complaining about the nominee for best sound. What people complain about are categories like best picture, best screenplay, best director. These are all things that the casual viewer of cinema are capable of critiquing. So no, Whoopi, you're not seeing something different than the rest of the world. You're seeing exactly the same thing and you're voting for crap that nobody likes. Films like Black Panther get nominated despite not being the best action film of the year or even the best Marvel film of the year because it's the first black Marvel movie. Hollywood is voting for films in order to show how woke they are. With the exception of A Star Is Born, all of the best picture nominations for this year all had a strong social justice message. It has been widely speculated that this is why Bradley Cooper was snubbed for best director. He's a straight white male who made a film without a social justice message. Here are the nominees for best picture and why they were nominated. Black Panther, Blackness. Black Klansman, Blackness. Bohemian Rhapsody, Gayness. The Favorite, Lesbianism and Feminism. The Green Book, Gayness and Blackness. Roma, Immigration. Vice, Anti-Republicanness. <laughs> and then of course, there is the remake of the film A Star Is Born, which has no central social justice message. It's simply, God forbid, a love story. Now this weekend, social media, honey, attacked Kentucky private school kids for this confrontation with the Native American Vietnam veteran. So the school kids were blamed for being the aggressors. But then the extended footage was released that showed a group of black Israelites mocking the kids and the Native American. So many uh, people admitted they made snap judgments before these other facts came in. But is it that we just 
instantly say that's what it is based on what we see in that moment and then have to walk stuff back when it turns out we're wrong. Why is that? Why is, do we keep making the same mistake? Because we're, we're desperate to get Trump out of office. <laughs> that's why. Not everybody, though. It is incredibly disturbing how delighted Joy Behar is about this. It's disturbing how readily the audience laughs at this insensitive joke. These women are trying to dismiss the horrific mistake that was made by the left. Whoopi Goldberg is not concerned about having made a snap judgment because it negatively affects these kids. She's concerned because it makes the left look bad. Joy Behar excuses the left with a joke about their desperation to get Trump out of office. Essentially, her argument falls along this line. We hate Trump so much, and we hate Trump supporters so much that it makes sense that we would then assume the worst of them. And she presents this as if it's a reasonable explanation. This is not reasonable, Joy. You are missing the huge lesson to take away from this incident. The lesson is don't hate entire groups of people simply because you disagree with their politics. This is the foundation upon which bigotry exists. This incident shows how utterly bigoted the media is against white men and specifically against Trump supporters. You should not be making excuses, Joy. You should hang your head in shame and apologize. If you did this, people might actually respect you a little bit. They should have been taught, you know, what would Jesus do? That's what Catholics are taught. And they were engaging these, these the, the people that were being aggressive to them. A chaperone should have said to them, don't engage, don't engage, you move along. Are you freaking kidding me? First of all, the kids did not engage. They were being shouted at ruthlessly by these crazy black guys. So the kids decided to ignore them and drown them out with a school chant, which is a brilliant strategy. It's nonviolent. They're not directly engaging with these people who are attacking them. They're minding their own business and they're having a bit of fun. When the Indian guy approached them, you'll notice that he goes up to two other boys who turn away from him before he goes up to Nicholas Sandman. Hey, 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 hey. I'm so <laughs> Nicholas Sandman later told reporters that he was unsure if the Indian man was being friendly or confrontational. So he simply stood there and he smiled at him. This was interpreted by everyone as a smug smirk, but it was just about the least confrontational thing Nicholas Sandman could have done. If you think Nicholas Sandman was trying to engage, here's a shot of him from another angle that actually shows him discouraging another student from engaging with one of the Indian guys. BS theory! It's not bullshit! BS theory! It's not bullshit! It's not bullshit! It's proven, man, come on! It's it's proven. You're right, it is proven! Nicholas Sandman reacted in precisely the same way as Martin Luther King would have. If any of you would stop to think about it for one moment, you would admit that. But because Nicholas Sandman is a white male Trump supporter, you condemn him just for standing there. There's something aggressive about standing there. Nicholas Sandman should get the Medal of Freedom. And, and then you there got, for a pro-life They were there for Then why did they need movement? those hats on their well, head? Well, and that's the other thing. You know, Catholic churches, you know, you get this, this exemption, this tax exemption, because you're not supposed to that's be political. Right. And, and and they had these 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 political you know these hats on and these these outfits. Again, where were the adults advising them? That, they, that they, they can't wear that. They can totally wear that. The Catholic school is not supposed to be political, but the students are totally allowed to be political. There is an insane amount of leftist propaganda in our public schools, disseminated by leftist school teachers. But you'll never see the ladies of The View complain about that. But when the students themselves desire to exercise their First Amendment rights to express their own political ideas, they are condemned. So it's fine if leftist employees in a public school indoctrinate kids with leftist propaganda, but it's not okay for conservative kids to express their own personal political views in any way whatsoever. This, ladies and gentlemen, is called a double standard. It is a perfect illustration of leftist hypocrisy. And then again, you've got this good Samaritan that's trying to separate them. Are you freaking kidding me? A good Samaritan? She says she watched hours of footage. She didn't notice that this Indian guy was just trying to get a viral video. He was clearly trying to become YouTube famous. He goes up to several of the kids to try to goad them into doing something negative so that he can become a YouTube hero. Frustratingly, he didn't even need the kids to do anything bad. He just had to tell a lie about them and the media 
instantly bought it. This shows what kind of a state our country is in. When innocent boys are condemned and this lying old degenerate who went and actively harassed a bunch of school kids is instantly believed. I don't normally get angry about politics, but I'm angry about this. And this woman here, her name is Sunny Hostin, she's making it even worse. She and Trevor Noah and everybody on CNN and all the other people in the media who are still condemning these boys, still to this day, they are the real villains in this story. Sure, the black guys were jerks, but nobody really takes those guys seriously. Sure, the Indian guy harassed them and got away with a sinister lie, but all that guy wanted was attention. These reporters and media personalities, they have audiences of millions, hundreds of millions, and much of their audience believes the nonsense that they spout every day. So for them to actually have all the facts now and still be condemning those boys, they need to take a serious look in the mirror. They need to take stock of what they're really doing in the world. They are exacerbating divisiveness in this country and they are knowingly using a lie to do so. This is the most sinister aspect of the entire story, the media. They are the real villains. You know, you have a 16 year old, he, he, he was smirking. He says he was silently praying. I don't know when I pray, I don't smirk, but- Yeah, keep piling onto the kid. Just keep justifying your hatred of a 15 year old boy who is being harassed by an old man while waiting for a bus. I'm sure you feel great about yourself, Sonny Hostin. There's a lot of things in this that I don't agree with. I don't think anyone should be doing the chop, the, the or when a Native American is banging their drum, I don't, I don't think you should be singing along if you're not a Native American in that way. That would be my comfort level, just out of respect. Yeah. I think it just makes everybody look bad. It is like a powder keg example right. of how divided we are. Mm -hmm. And I don't, at this point, know if there's coming back from how divided we are. And it just made me depressed literally all weekend, ask Abby. What the hell is Meghan McCain talking about? What a spineless weasel. This is not a powder keg example of how divided we are. This is a perfect example of how racist people are against white boys. Why can't you just say that? You're supposed to be the conservative on the show. Meghan McCain, this is what you should have said. You should have turned to the other ladies and you should have said, you ladies are disgusting. Those boys were simply standing there waiting for a bus. These psychopathic racist black guys were harassing them and then an old Indian guy went up to harass them. Then everybody in the media condemned the boys and you're here justifying it. You should be disgusted with yourselves. You can't do that, Meghan McCain. That's too complicated for you. Somebody get her off the show and get a real conservative in there. Get a woman with some balls. And yes, I realize what I just said. Just hours after BuzzFeed posted an article claiming attorney Michael Cohen was directed by you know who to lie to Congress under oath, Mueller's team issued a statement that, quote, the characterization of documents and testimony obtained regarding Cohen's testimony are not accurate. It gives me some comfort that he doesn't want it to take this on a BS premise. I don't yeah. want anybody oh. putting out BS, and that makes me feel better. Well, it also should make the Trump people feel better that this so-called witch hunt is not happening. Mm -hmm. and maybe get off of Mueller's back about cr creating a witch hunt when mm -hmm. Mueller has now shown you that he's fair and balanced, he's unlike, unlike yeah. uh, Trump's yeah. cheerleaders. And I think he did that in... Oh yeah, because sending in SEAL Team 6, four tanks and a Black Hawk helicopter to arrest Roger Stone is totally fair and balanced. And yes, I realize that was a bit of hyperbole, but not much. Arresting everybody that Trump knows on perjury charges. That's really fair and balanced. Oh yeah, I have so much confidence in Mueller now, now that he's contradicted a single false story reported in the news because, because there haven't been hundreds of false stories being perpetrated in the mainstream media every freaking day. You know what should make you ladies feel better? Hearing that Trump hasn't committed any crimes. Shouldn't you be happy to hear that the President of the United States hasn't committed a crime? No, because you would love that, because you're insane. They all have Trump derangement syndrome. And also, why say accurate rather than truthful? That's well, interesting and that's, wording. He, he didn't say that the story was false, right. he said it was inaccurate. Right. And I think there's a big distinction between the two. These Trump haters are always grasping at straws. He didn't say it was not true, he said it was inaccurate. I'm sorry, ladies, that's the same thing. Let me just say one thing, though, about this. The media, they don't understand, but they are actually going to help Trump get reelected. If these are the stories they're putting out, two unnamed sources, and everyone runs with this, this is the greatest gift that the Trump administration could ask for. Abby Huntsman said something smart. <laughs> it just goes to show you that fallible people can write fallible stories. Mm -hmm. Fallible politicians can tell fallible stories as well. None of us is perfect. Sometimes people get it wrong.
And so don't get it twisted. Look at yourself, say, have I ever gotten it wrong? And then proceed forward. <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg just told everybody, no one is perfect, so be careful about judging others who might make mistakes. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Whoopi Goldberg needs to write a book of advice and then she needs to read the book and then take all of the advice. It is unbelievable the level of hypocrisy that exists within the minds of these women. If she would, just for one moment, consider what she's saying and apply it to herself, maybe she would finally realize that Trump is not the bad guy. Whoopi Goldberg, you are the bad guy. <laughs> so you were at the Globes recently. I was. And um, you had a Times Up ribbon on the back of your dress with the with the little X, what is it, X2. What Times Up Times 2. Times mm. 2. So yeah. explain what that is because I'm really bad at this. So we're, you know, and, I, and I'm definitely not one of the, uh, you know, the, the main circle of Times Up. I would say that there's a lot of wonderful women that lead the Times Up organization, so I'm not necessarily should be the representative uh -huh. of it in this moment, but I can say that the initiative for this this year was just to double the number. Double the number. You have you hire one female, hire two. You hire one female right. director, hire two. You just the idea that like that's how that's how easy it is to help create change and push the needle right. forward. Wow. Okay, so let's say I'm a writer director in Hollywood. Some people read my script, they love it, they bring me in to discuss. Everybody's convinced that my script, my project is the best project that they have available to produce. Everybody's convinced that I'm the guy that needs to direct it. And then somebody says, but wait. We only did one female filmmaker's project this year. We should really do two. Now, in this hypothetical world, the best female project is nowhere near as good, but it's a female project. So now this business is supposed to decline the best project that they have available because they have some moral obligation to hire more women. Not only is that insane, but it is totally sexist. The thinking here, of course, is that Hollywood is already super sexist against women and that women are all just as good as men at everything, so replacing men with women is an ethical decision with zero consequence to the quality or success of any project. That is what we typically call in politics, um, bullshit. Now, I've worked on a lot of film, TV, and commercial sets, and I have observed a lot of directors, and men tend to make better directors than women. While writing the script for this video, I asked my girlfriend, who's worked on about as many film, TV, and commercial sets as I have, about her perceptions about the differences between male and female directors. Her response, female directors are bitchy, male directors are nice. <laughs> she elaborated, of course, gave examples, but the point is that Typically, female directors tend to feel some need to assert their authority on set by shouting a lot, by being angry about everything, and generally trying to scare everyone into submission. Male directors tend to be very, very cool. There are, of course, exceptions to both rules. Furthermore, I think men tend to make better films. And Hollywood is not sexist against women. Hollywood is a crazy hard left paradise where the hierarchy of oppression reigns supreme. They have all kinds of programs here to benefit women and minorities. They will always be chosen first and get the most and best opportunities in every facet of the business. If you're a white male in Hollywood, you're basically a leper. And don't even think about expressing a conservative view. I think you get hanged for that in California. Hiring women for the sake of hiring women in an environment where women actually have more opportunities than men is not just silly, it's sexist. And it's harmful to everyone. The investors, the crew, the actors, the audience. Don't saddle us with bad films and television shows just because you want to see more women working in certain jobs. Let the market choose the best people. Hollywood is screwed up enough with the way it chooses projects and talent. We don't need to promote more stupid thinking. Your movie, uh, Miss Bala, which I saw yes. yesterday, was terrific. It's breaking all kinds of barriers, right? It's directed by a woman. Yeah. Stars a female Puerto Rican. And 95% uh, of the cast and crew are Latino. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. Having just that sole responsibility on this project and having such a great sense of pride to have been able to make this with my community, and I say the entire Latinx community, there were Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, Colombians, Venezuelans, Argentinians, Dominicans, like, we were, it was beautiful. Yeah. It was... 95%. I mean, everywhere you turned, and it was a different dialect, and it was Spanish and English and some different slang and some different mm -hmm. food and some different mm -hmm. kind of, like, music. It was reggaeton or mariachi or, you know, oh, cumbia I would have or enjoyed merengue. enjoyed that set. So much, <laughs> girl. So much. <laughs> This really annoys me. Honestly, I wouldn't even care about her excitement over the Hispanic nature of the project or Latin X, as she refers to it, the stupidest SJW trend of 2018. I wouldn't care about any of this except that the excitement rests on an underlying assumption of some 
absurd lack of inclusion. The truth is, Hollywood excludes just about every group. How many Welsh films does Hollywood produce every year? How many films are set in Moldova? I don't see many Mauritian actors represented in Hollywood. How is that cool? The problem with the insistence for diversity in Hollywood is that every country, every people, can develop their own films. They don't need Hollywood. You just need talent and money. Every country has money, so you just need to find the talent. If super rich people anywhere in the world want to produce films that represent their culture, they have the option to do so. Do I think the system is perfect? No. Do I think it's a fair system? Absolutely not. Actually, I think the system is extremely unfair and far from perfect. But it's not because of a lack of inclusion, rather because of an overabundance of it. Actually, the real problem in Hollywood is nepotism. But because nobody can do anything about that, they scream racism and sexism. But entertainment is such a profitable business that companies can be nepotistic and bigoted against white men and still be highly profitable. So so why does Gina Rodriguez believe that the owners of these companies have to bow to her desire for more Hispanics in their projects? Why should they not include more Germans and Scots? How about more people from Oregon? People from Oregon are super underrepresented in Hollywood. I think that's racist. I think they need to give me priority here. The crazy thing about this is that there are tons of Latino actors working in Hollywood. There are tons of Latino shows. They're always celebrating Latino culture and pronouncing places and names with a Hispanic accent for some reason. Wasn't the big story the defeat of Ortega and the fall of the Sandinistas. Excuse me, everybody. I'd like you to meet our new economics correspondent, Antonio Mendoza. <laughs> well, or Antonio Mendoza. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I've just been noticing that you guys really are up on your Spanish pronunciation. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. But uh, well, if you don't mind, if you don't mind me saying so, sometimes these Spanish words, when you take them and you sort of kind of overpronounce them in it, Kind of annoying. Really? Really? Yeah. Yeah. The truth is, the only really intelligent way to run Hollywood is to find and hire the best talent for every job. To neglect talent, to push race or gender, will only ever result in an inferior product. And what this woman is supporting is pure racism and sexism. She's saying, we should hire women and minorities. That leaves literally one group left out, white men. So basically, you can hire anybody but white men. This is not justice. This is bigotry. Okay, let's move on to the next episode. Only 7% of voters support giving <coughs> Trump funding for his border wall. 7%, according to political Of call. voters? Of uh, voters, yeah. Oh, total voters. Of voters. Wow. Yeah. Seems I haven't heard small. that number yeah. before. Yeah. Joy Behar is an idiot. So I looked into this insane statistic, which should jump out at any reasonable person as being insane. As it turns out, this is from a Pew Research poll, and you guessed it, Joy Behar is totally wrong. So 7% is actually 11%, and that statistic refers only to Americans opposed to the wall. The real statistic is from a question about anti-Trump voters' willingness to compromise. Pew divided the people who they polled into two categories, those who are pro-wall and those who are against the wall. Then Pew asked the anti-wall people this question. If funding the wall is the only way to end the shutdown, would you fund the wall? And of those Trump-hating anti-wall people, 11% of them said that they would give Trump his money in order to end the shutdown. That is the statistic, Joy Behar, you batty old hag. The Daily Beast misreported this as 7%, which is, I assume, where Joy Behar got the number. This seems to be something that happens a lot on The View. A lot. Blatant falsehoods. Is this intentional deception? Did Joy Behar genuinely believe this number? I don't know. But if it was a mistake, any rational person would question that number and look into it. Ask a PA five minutes before the show, because that's how long it took me to look it up. The View is actually a great show if your aim is to be wrong about everything. But isn't it a little convenient? Yeah. It's the and longest in history. That, you know, yeah. the FBI is going to be furloughed also, and they're the ones who are investigating him. It's a little convenient. <laughs> I think yeah, that's it, Joy. That's Trump's nefarious scheme. He wants to shut down the government so that the FBI will stop investigating him. It's so obvious. How did we not see this before? Thank you, Joy. Thank you for opening our eyes to the great shutdown conspiracy. This woman, ladies and gentlemen, is a genius. If you look at what the government <laughs> shutdown is costing <laughs> our collective economy, yeah. it's already almost $6 billion. The cost of the wall the that he's wall. proposing is, is, the, is about $6 billion. So it just doesn't make sense, even from the Trump administration's point of view, to continue the shutdown. Yeah. So I keep on wondering what the, on what the strategy is. Sonny Hostin just made a brilliant case for Trump. 
This woman is so thick that she doesn't realize she has just pointed out the absurdity of Pelosi and the Democrats in Congress, which are the people she's trying to support here. I feel like I'm watching a soccer match and this chick just awkwardly kicked the ball into her own goal and nobody had the heart to tell her. Now I would like to address Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. Did you hear that, guys? You just wasted six billion American tax dollars so that you wouldn't have to pay 5.7 billion American tax dollars for Trump's wall. I feel like I'm your mom saying this, but I hope you're proud of yourselves. You are petulant children. On to the next episode. There is no venue that can compete with the history, tradition, and importance of the House Chamber. I look forward to giving a great State of the Union address in the near future. Yeah. And everyone is saying, well, wait a minute, what happened? Yeah, I don't yeah, trust this. This is, that was weird. I, don't, I mean, what, since when have you seen him just give up like that? He got it's, spanked by another woman. He, no, yeah. yeah. Look at that face, you want to punch that face. I don't know. I read I, I, that, just... it, was, it sounded so nice, <laughs> it wasn't naked. It one. was so yes, sweet yes. and nice. Uh, <laughs> Look at how bewildered Sonny Hostin is that Trump would do something reasonable and nice. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the result of TDS, Trump Derangement Syndrome. If Trump Derangement Syndrome lasts more than four hours, please contact a doctor. Sonny, you sit next to Joy Behar and Whoopi Goldberg every day for work. When they say something reasonable, then you can be shocked. No. You, you had, you had you an update on, on, about the TSA. On, the, on the announcement from the, T, the guy that runs the, the TSA. No, just was, that he was on television yesterday warning people that the air controllers are going to be dwindling down to zero. Right. Yeah. It's becoming very dangerous to fly, and they, the equipment is not being updated, and it's extremely, extremely dangerous. And what's, why, what are they waiting for? Are they waiting for, God forbid, another crash, an airline crash? What are oh, they God. waiting for? Yeah. The only person who's enjoying this shutdown is Vladimir Putin. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look how angry she is. She says this with such conviction, as if she really believes it, as if she's really angry about this. Behar, why are you so crazy? This is just laughable. Putin, seriously? The ironic thing is that she's a comedian, and this is the funniest thing I've heard her say since I started doing these videos. And she wasn't even trying to be funny here. It's so funny that the left is on this anti-Russia kick. You're all socialists. You should love Russia. The Russia thing is just so stupid. It's, it's hilarious to watch the left work themselves up about this, you know. So Michael Cohen says he's postponing his testimony to Congress because of recent threats to his family by you know who and his lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, take a look. <laughs> he should give information maybe on his father-in-law because that's the one that people want to look at because where does that money, that's the money in the family. His father-in-law is a Ukrainian. His father-in-law has not a crime. millions and millions. Of, of course it's not. I'm telling you, it comes from the Ukraine. The reason that's important is he may have ties to something called organized crime. Well, but it's By not only flawed thinking. I think it's called witness tampering, right? Yeah, yeah I was yeah. going to say, it's not only flawed thinking, it could very well be a federal crime. Yeah, I mean, if you you're do that. Witness tampering, that's 20 years in a federal prison if you're found guilty of that. And, you know, th this president doesn't know the law. He's not a lawyer. But Giuliani would. But Giuliani was the U.S. attorney of the Southern District of New York, which arguably is the most powerful U.S. attorney's office in the country. Mm -hmm. And he headed it for, like, how six dumb years. How dumb so there are a few categories that we might put Trump allegations into. One, outright lies. Two, misinterpretations. Three, absurdly convoluted logic. This accusation rests firmly in the third category. The idea here is that Trump's tweet, watch Cohen's father-in-law. The idea is that this is a thinly veiled threat to murder Cohen's father-in-law if Cohen says anything to prosecutors or something like that. This is absurd. Nobody actually thinks that this is a threat. Trump tweets stuff like that all the time. He's basically saying, if you want to know how crooked Cohen is, look at his father-in-law. Trump thinks Cohen's father-in-law is connected to the Ukrainian mafia, and maybe he is. Maybe Trump knows about something. I mean, he knew Cohen for many years, so it makes sense that he might know something like this. But the Trump haters will concoct any story they can to try to get Trump. And so, you know, I don't put this into the misinterpretation category because nobody is misinterpreting this. Everybody knows what Trump meant. This is, this is just a way to manipulate the legal system, to turn it into a weapon to use against a political enemy, in this case, Trump. Everybody who goes along with this baloney is complicit in deceitful and pathetic scheming. Along with these women, 
for perpetrating the idea through their show. I feel sorry for Michael Cohen because he's frightened and he's frightened for his family. But yeah. I say put him in witness protection. This is a mob movie anyway. It, put it him feel, in it well, the whole like family that. needs to go in witness protection at least temporarily while he testifies oh. on February 7th. Look how serious Joy Behar is here. She's actually convinced herself that this nonsense is true. She thinks that Cohen and his entire family need to go into witness protection to keep them safe from Donald Trump. Joy He's not Bill or Hillary Clinton, all right? He doesn't go around murdering political opponents. Only guilty people have to do that. The hysteria here is insane with these people. I do think that they have driven themselves into having a serious mental condition that needs to be treated. Trump has done absolutely nothing ever in his life to suggest that he would put a hit out on somebody, but Joy Behar is sitting there telling the viewers that Trump is a Godfather-style mafia boss who wouldn't hesitate to kill Cohen's family if Cohen doesn't do what he wants. Joy Behar is an idiot. Listen, if he has a role in getting this president out, he's okay with me, okay? That's what I'm saying. I know this is redundant, but Joy Behar is an idiot. It's at this point that they bring on Chris Cuomo of CNN, the guy who said this. We couldn't help her any more than we have. I know. You know what I mean? She's, she's I know. got just a free ride so far from the media. We're the biggest ones promoting her campaign, so it better happen. Chris Cuomo is actually one of the least crazy leftists within the crazy left mainstream media, and he's still a complete wacko. I think he tries to appear to be more even-handed than most, but I don't think he, he's actually trying to be even-handed. I think he's just attempting to appear that way. I mean, he basically admitted to being a shill for Hillary. We couldn't help her any more than we have. <laughs> We're the biggest ones promoting our campaign. All right, let's see what this even-handed, totally objective voice of reason has to say. Should they be looking at witness tampering? Does it rise to the level of witness tampering? Witness tampering uh, doesn't have to be successful to be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, the attempt right. is enough. Right. And if you look what the president has been saying, you have to do an examination of the hardest part of the law, correct me if I'm wrong, which is motivation. Yeah. Yeah. Why is the president saying what he's saying about his father-in-law? Now, it can just be, this is what this president chooses to do with his political power, right. is that he likes to disparage those who he sees as opposition. Or that could be it. Uh, it could be that he believes that by saying this, he will quiet Michael Cohen. And right now, That's he was right. He was yeah. right. Uh, because it did. It's amazing to me that Chris Cuomo can say this with a straight face. It's bizarre because he actually explains things exactly right in the first half of his answer. If you want to prosecute Trump for intimidation, you have to prove motivation, which is pretty much impossible. And then he says it may just be that Trump likes to disparage his opposition. It may be that? Of course he does. Little Rubio, Lion Ted, Pocahontas. What do you mean it may just be that? Of course it's that. So great, he lays out the reasonable truth of the situation. You have to prove motivation, which is impossible, and it may be that Trump was just being disparaging, which it was. But then he shovels on top of this reason, a giant steaming turd of nonsense. Cuomo says, it may be that Trump was trying to quiet Michael Cohen, and it worked. He will quiet Michael Cohen. And right now, That's he was right. It was really? A, you know it's not that. B, it didn't work. Michael Cohen is pretending to feel threatened because he wants to play the victim and garner sympathy. It's an obvious ploy. To say that it worked assumes the intention of Trump's tweet, which you just said is the most difficult thing to prove. So this is the most difficult thing to prove. Let's make huge assumptions about it anyway. What a moron. Do I believe Michael Cohen's, uh, through his counsel, his fears about his family? I do. Um, because, and God willing, you guys don't have to uh, feel this. When you are on the wrong side of the president in the perspective of those who support him, it is a frightening place. Yeah. Well, actually, you're all on the other side of Trump. You literally spread false news about him every single day. So you must all be terrified. Why are you still in the country? What are you waiting for? Run for your lives. Darth Trump probably sent his stormtroopers to hunt you down already. They could be there any second. Oh yeah, that's right. None of you are scared at all. You're in fact very comfortably chatting and laughing on a daytime talk show dedicated to spreading anti-Trump propaganda, and your complete sense of safety and security comes from the fact that you are 100% confident that Trump will in no way abuse his power as president to retaliate. Because Trump doesn't do that. He's never done anything like that, and you have no reason to believe he ever will. But it's fun to speculate and pretend you think he will, because it sounds really bad. And anything you can say to make Trump sound really bad is really good. Right, guys? Right? You degenerates. I think a lot of what we're dealing with in this dynamic with the probe 
is not about whether or not something is a crime. Mm -hmm. It's about what is wrong. It's not about whether or not the president, to your earlier conversation, has the right mm -hmm. to do something. Mm -hmm. It's about whether or not what he's doing is right. right. What in the living hell are you talking about, Chris Cuomo? This is such a mental thing to say, and it has become, I guess, standard thinking on the left. I think that there's a lot of people more concerned about being precisely factually and semantically correct than about being morally right. The law doesn't matter. What matters is whether I think Trump is a good guy or not. The only question that we can ask is, does he have the right to do something? We're talking about a legal investigation into whether Trump committed treason. Whether we think Trump is doing the right thing or not morally, that's something we all have to judge for ourselves using our own moral compass. For a reporter to say this is absurd. It's not about whether or not something is a crime. Mm -hmm. It's about what is wrong, whether or not what he's doing is right. right. The entire philosophy behind proper reporting is present the public with honest, objective facts so that they can properly derive from those facts their own ideas about the moral integrity of people and where they stand on the issues. I got this from the Wikipedia article, Journalism, Ethics, and Standards. While various existing codes have some differences, most share common elements, including the principles of truthfulness, accuracy, objectivity, impartiality, fairness, and public accountability. In essence, tell the truth and be objective. Holding Trump to some arbitrary moral criteria is a total rejection of ethical standards of journalism. Who sets this moral criteria? You, Chris Cuomo, CNN, Mueller, Hillary, Bernie, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the ladies of The View? We have left the bounds of journalism and we've entered into the arena of arbitrary moral judgments. Moral judgments that can be shifted in any direction we like in order to target Donald Trump, who we hate. There is no standard here. Cuomo, CNN, The View, these people don't care about facts. They care about appearing to hold the moral high ground. Furthermore, politics isn't about morality. Peter Hitchens made a brilliant observation. Morality is about what you do when you think no one is looking. Your position on the border wall or sexism or the environment has absolutely nothing to do with your morality. These are merely concerns that people have that should be discussed in order to decide how we might best move forward as a society. Although you need a moral compass in order to take a position on most issues, labeling an opponent as immoral for disagreeing with you merely inhibits discussion, which is basically all politics is. Another brilliant observation of Peter Hitchens, you cannot debate someone who despises you. It's pointless. When a personal hatred exists, the views of the hated person will be determined to be wrong merely because that person holds them, as opposed to being wrong because of some demonstrated facts or reason. The left's hatred of the wall demonstrates this perfectly. Before Trump, everyone was fine with the wall. Badly needed funding for better fences. Uh, physical barriers, if necessary, in some places. I voted for 700 miles. Construction of a 630-mile border fence create a significant barrier to illegal immigration on our southern land border. Now that Trump's for a wall, walls are racist. A Damn. wall is an immorality. The left doesn't think that the wall is racist on any kind of rational grounds. They believe it's racist because they think that the evil Sith Lord, Darth Trump, is racist, and he wants it. Therefore, they are projecting their judgments about him onto his political positions. They will not discuss a wall. Not because it's without merit, but because it's Trump's thing. Trump bad, wall bad. It's a terrible way to inform your political positions. We have a tremendous amount of circumstantial evidence on yes. emoluments, on witness yes. tampering, on collusion, yes. on, 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 on obstruction of justice, yes. right to our face. Yes. Why is he still there? Everything Joy Behar just said is total bullshit. She believes that there's a tremendous amount of circumstantial evidence because she believes literally every rumor she hears about Trump. Any insane theory that any random Trump hater proposes, no matter how absurd, no matter how baseless or fabricated, is, to Joy Behar, an absolute truth. Her tremendous amount of circumstantial evidence is a steaming pile of bullshit that no reasonable person not suffering from Trump derangement syndrome would believe. He started with no contacts. Yeah. Then there was a ton of contacts. Yeah. So then it was no collusion. Right. Now he says, well, it wasn't me. There were no contacts, there was no collusion by anyone, and there was no collusion by Trump. All of those things are true. There were not a ton of contacts. Your definition of contact is drastically different than Trump's, and now the definition of collusion is shifting to whatever you guys at CNN seem to want it to be. When we're talking about contacts, Trump's talking about 
contacts within the Russian government. He's not talking about some random Russian guy off the street. If you ask a politician whether he's colluded with a foreign government in order to fix an election, you can't then point out contact that somebody working for a political campaign had with a random Russian guy and then scream, gotcha. This is a logical fallacy known as moving the goalposts. If you accuse somebody of murder, we do not put them in prison because you can prove that their brother shoplifted. Trump isn't changing his story. You are constantly redefining collusion. For the record, I am colluding with a Russian. 80% of Republicans believe it and st still back the president. Yes. That's a fact. Yes, he's doing very well within his party. Very so, well. Mm. So... <laughs> Look at how pissed off Joy Behar is. She's got this face like, Republicans are so despicable. It's so funny to see somebody who is so convinced that she's right and she feels totally justified casting her smug judgment on 55 million people. I just take solace in knowing that no one like her will ever be in power. A wall is an immorality. Oh yeah. Crap. This administration lies more than anything I have ever yeah. seen in public. Clearly, you haven't been paying attention to your brother's political career. Governor, you have led the most corrupted state government in America. Eight individuals closely associated with your administration are now uh, going to jail or have gone to jail for federal corruption charges. And anywhere else in America, no governor could possibly be running for re-election. The problem Andrew has is that everybody knows that behind the scenes, he is the dirtiest, nastiest political player out there. The only reason that Chris Cuomo can say that the Trump administration lies more than anything he's ever seen in the political office is because he accepts utter distortions of Trump's statements. The Washington Post keeps a count of Trump's so-called lies. Let me give you a couple of examples. Trump once said that African-American unemployment has reached the lowest level in history. Now, they acknowledge that this is true, but they still labeled it as a lie because they didn't think Trump should be taking credit. No joke. Trump once said that a typical family of four earning $75,000 a year will see their tax bill slashed in half. Again, this was incontrovertibly true, but it was labeled a lie because the tax cuts weren't permanent. But lots of legislation has time limits, and they need to be extended. This in no way made Trump's statement a lie. Trump once said, the state of Florida was a great victory, a big victory. This was labeled a lie because Trump only won by 1.2%, but Trump didn't mean he won by a significant margin. He meant that the victory was important. It could be argued that Florida is the most important of all the states to win, so yeah, it was a great victory. This is the kind of thing that is characterized as a Trump lie by the mainstream media. Mischaracterizations, disagreements of opinion, and outright lies by the media. So when Chris Cuomo talks about how much the Trump administration lies, he is himself lying. I think they're amazing journalists, by the way, at CNN. Jake Tapper, uh, Essie Cobb, Van Jones, they're great people. Then there's people like Jim Acosta that make me want to change the channel. Jim Acosta, and look, he doesn't need me to defend him. He does well on his own, uh, but him, testing power, him demanding accountability from power is his job. Jim Acosta is an asshole. Jim Acosta was banished from the White House press corps not because he challenged the president or his policies. Jim Acosta was banished for being a dick. Mr. President, will you stop calling us the enemy of the people, sir? Will you stop calling the press the enemy of the people, sir? Mr. President, will you stop calling the press the enemy of the people, sir? Why don't we Jen. turn the cameras on? Jen. Why don't we turn the cameras on? I'm sorry that you have to do it. Jen, go ahead. Why not turn the cameras on, Sean? Jen. They're Jen. in the room. The lights are on. Continue to mix things why up. Why are the cameras off, Sean? Try. Why, are they, why did you turn Try. them off? Can you just Try. give us an answer to that? Can Try. you tell us why you turned the cameras off? Why are they off, Sean? Since you're attacking us, can you give us a question? Go Since ahead. you're... No, Mr. President-elect. Go ahead. Mr. President-elect, since you are attacking no, our news not organization, you. Not can you. you give us a chance? Your organization You are is attacking terrible. our news organization. organization. Can you give us a chance Let's to go. ask a question, sir? Go ahead. Sir, can Quiet. you state... Can, Quiet. Mr. President-elect, go ahead. Can you state She's categorically... Mr. President-elect, can you give us a question? Don't be rude. You're attacking us. Can you give us a question? Don't be rude. Can you give us a question? I'm not going to give you a question. Can you state categorically... You are fake news. Why is it, Mr. President, that you always seem to side with the accused and not the accuser. Is that because of the many, many allegations that you've had uh, made against you over the years? I think the president has made his position known. I also think it's would you, ironic. Would you mind telling us, I'm, I'm Sarah, trying to answer you your question. Okay, well, I, I politely waited and I even called on you despite the fact that you interrupted me while calling on your colleague. Well, you I said it's ironic. Which is why yes. I interrupted. I'm trying. But if you, if you finish, if you would not mind letting me have a follow up, that would be fine. I think you should let me run the country. You run CNN. All right. And if you did it well, your ratings well, would be ask, much better. Let me ask, if I may okay, ask one other question. Mr. President, if I may. If 
I may uh, ask Peter, one other question, are you worried? That's enough. That's Ms. enough. Mr. President, I, well, that's I was going to ask one of the, the other folks. That's had, enough. Pardon me, ma'am. I'm, I'm, Mr. Excuse President. Me. That's enough. Mr. Pre I'll tell you what. CNN should be ashamed of itself having you working for them. You are a rude, terrible person. You shouldn't be working for CNN. You're a very rude person. The way you treat Sarah Huckabee is horrible. And the way you treat other people are horrible. You shouldn't treat people that way. Go ahead. Don't confuse things, Cuomo. Acosta is not some noble defender of truth holding the powerful accountable. Jim Acosta is a rude, impudent, attention-seeking provocateur who just stepped over the line one too many times. You know, he would step across the line. Habitually. He's a habitual line stepper. All right, let's move on to the last episode. And and we are now up to 37 arrests in the Mueller investigation. <laughs> and zero of them have anything to do with Russian collusion. Look how happy she is about this. <laughs> Look at that face, you wanna punch that face. These people are sick. They're taking pleasure in 37 people being arrested in an intimidation technique to try to unethically compel them to testify against the president, even if that testimony is false. You know what it's called when an ordinary person threatens someone in order to get something that they want? It's called extortion. But when Robert Mueller does it, it's apparently investigating. Keep laughing, Joy. I'm sure you'd find it just as exciting if it was you who was falsely charged with perjury. Well, well let me just tell you guys, you, too much legal stuff. I am just so damn happy this guy is indicted and arrested. Uh, nah. He is a horrible human being. He, he is, is a yeah. thug. He is a bully. He has said horrible things about your father. He has yeah. said horrible things about me. Hey everybody, how cool Anna Navarro is in this episode. Honestly, I love to hate Whoopi and Joy, but there's no one quite so unlikable in all of political punditry as this burning pile of human garbage, Anna Navarro. She's even happier than Joy Behar is about this. I am just so damn happy this guy is indicted and arrested. Uh. Yes, isn't it wonderful that somebody's been arrested on bullshit? charges. Where the hell are these women when an illegal immigrant kills an innocent American? I've never heard any one of you cackling witches ever celebrate the arrest of any of these murderers. But oh yes, let's celebrate an old man who couldn't remember an email during testimony. Give me a break. It's shocking to me that they let these women on television. I could understand if they were super hot, but come on. He has said horrible things about your father. He has yeah. said horrible things about me. Let me read you one before I don't... <laughs> He got banned from Twitter for saying horrible, racist, offensive things about Don Lemon, about me, about Roland yeah. Martin. Three. I am a happy person today. Yeah. Let me just say what it says. It says, mm -hmm. this is from his Twitter account. <laughs> really? At Anna Navarro is fat, stupid, and what? Bleeping out cardness. Well, guess what, That's baby? That's his fiance. Uh, Anna Navarro is marrying Al Cardenas, and mm -hmm. Bob Mueller is bleeping you. Bye-bye, <laughs> <laughs> baby. Yeah. Karma is a bitch. <laughs> yeah. God. There is a term that is currently in vogue throughout social media. The word is cringy. Anna Navarro is the definition of cringy. Karma is a bitch, <laughs> bitch, bitch. <laughs> wow, Anna Navarro. So you're happy because you have a personal grievance against Roger Stone for tweeting something mean to you, and you're willing to dramatically express that on national television. Okay. Pretty sure that's what is generally referred to as petty. But if you want to own your pettiness, I guess that's on you, lady. Anna and I don't agree on many things, but one thing we can definitely agree on is that Roger Stone is a bastard from hell oh. who deserves everything he's going to yeah. get. He's been known for 40... It's not... She's... It's all legitimate. He's been doing this for 40 years. He used to work in the Nixon administration. He's, to say he has a, a nebulous criminal past is putting it very lightly. Mm -hmm. This was a long time coming. As far as I'm concerned, he should have been arrested a long time ago. I've read up a bit on Roger Stone. Roger Stone is a prankster. He's not a murderer or a rapist. Pranks can rise to the level of criminality, but Roger Stone is very careful not to cross that line. This prankster mentality has allowed him to be extraordinarily effective as a political strategist. In the 1990s, when Ross Perot spoiled George Bush Sr.'s chances for winning a second term by splitting the Republican vote, Roger Stone realized the extreme danger of conservative third-party candidates. So he single-handedly dismantled Ross Perot's Reform Party using truly diabolical scheming. He did this so that it would never threaten a Republican candidate ever again. It was utterly unscrupulous, and it was brilliant, and I, for one, am very happy that he did this. In 2004, Roger Stone flipped to the Democratic side 
working for Al Sharpton, but Stone had no intention of helping Al Sharpton get elected president. Stone was using Sharpton to cause division within the Democratic Party. He was also trying to destroy the Democrats from the inside out. Again, diabolical, but brilliant. And again, I'm happy he did this. These are the kinds of schemes that earned Roger Stone the moniker Dirty Trickster, and it's well earned. However, dirty tricks are not the same as crimes. Roger Stone is myopically obsessed with the advancement of the Republican Party, and he puts all of his dirty tricks to use against Democrats in order to advance the success of Republican politicians. And this is why leftists hate him so much. But even if you hate Roger Stone, taking delight in his arrest reveals something about your character. A reasonable person wants justice. A petty person simply wants their enemies to suffer, even if that suffering is unjust. I fiercely oppose the political ideas of Elizabeth Warren. The way she mischaracterizes the right and distorts reality for her own benefit and the advancement of her politics, I think is despicable. My papa had high cheekbones. But I don't want Elizabeth Warren thrown in jail when she hasn't actually committed any crimes. Roger Stone is a bisexual, pro-choice, drug-legalizing libertarian. He's not a conservative. Roger Stone has been successful in politics because he uses leftist political strategies against leftists. He's a lot like Roger Ailes, but he fights against the left. So it's pretty funny to see leftists hate him so much. Roger Stone is an attention seeker. He's a prankster, a schemer. He's the Dennis the Menace of the Republican Party. You may find him annoying. You may even hate him, but that doesn't make him evil. If he's done anything illegal, I think arresting him and prosecuting him is appropriate. But we don't actually know that he has done anything illegal, and I, for one, don't believe that he has. The prosecution of Roger Stone looks a lot more like persecution than prosecution, which is exactly what they did with Paul Manafort. The idea here is to turn the screws on Roger Stone, to torture him a little bit, so that he squeals. And if there's nothing real to squeal about, the hope is that he will compose, that he will make something up that is convincing enough so that Robert Mueller and company will feel justified in bringing down Donald Trump. But what if, what if Roger Stone is so dang brilliant that this is what he wants? What if the early morning SWAT team raid was his idea? What if the Russian collusion investigation was Stone's idea? What if Robert Mueller's investigation is all a Roger Stone scheme? What if Roger Stone orchestrated this entire investigation circus in order to distract from other scandals that might come up against Trump? What if all the Democrats, CNN, the ladies of The View, are all so distracted by Russian collusion that they're ignoring anything else that Trump might be doing that would be considered scandalous? And what if Robert Mueller is part of it all? What if, by the end of this exhaustive investigation, Robert Mueller produces a document that clears Trump in such a detailed and thorough manner that it eliminates all doubt of his innocence? What if this was the plan all along? Maybe that's why the investigation has taken so long. It's all a diabolical Roger Stone scheme. I wouldn't put it past him. If that's the case, these women are all duped. They're buying the circumstantial evidence just as Stone wants them buying it. And they're celebrating the arrests exactly as Stone wants as well. I don't know if this is true, but I don't think it's impossible. Well, you know, he, he, was on, he was on The View. He's been here. Yes, he yes. has been. He showed me his Nixon tattoo on his back. Next time I see it, it's going to be at Rutgers. <laughs> I, I, so. no, I had an idea that you, me, and Anna should go visit him in jail. But one, okay, one thing, and I yeah. Their glee right now at this man's persecution says so much about who these women are as people. Not, yeah, I'm not going to visit him is, anywhere. I'm not going to. Getting, I'll go visit him in hell. We, Sadly, I think you probably will, Anna. We, we all agree that, that he's a horrible person. Yeah, yeah. Why is it that Donald Trump surrounds himself? I don't know. With all of these Why people. Do you think? Because my mother no one, always because no told one else me. Would work for him my mother at always the time. told me, show Seriously. me who you walk with, and I'll tell you who you right. are. Right. And that is what this is about. Because they're effective. Oftentimes, the people who are the best at their jobs are also the ugliest. That's the unfortunate nature of the world. Anyway, look around you, Sonny Hostin. People who live in glass houses should not throw stones. Aaron, Let's I will take say, bets. Let's say Donald Jr. is going to get indicted and they go to Donald Sr. and say, look, your son's going to go to jail. Would you quit now? Mm, thinking, thinking. <laughs> he's my son. I think he's the mommy dearest of fathers. But, really? And I don't, but yes. at the time, I don't know if he would even resign for his son. At, Another hate fantasy of Joy Behar. You know, I can imagine her laying awake at night fantasizing about various scenarios in which Trump might be evil in order to give her some more random, unjustified accusations to sling the next morning on the show. Trump is so evil, I bet he'd even sacrifice his own children. <laughs> she hasn't yet accused him of cannibalism, but just wait. I'm sure it's coming.
This woman is a professional Trump hater. That has become her actual career. At Maybe the time they bragged. They were Ivanka. very, but they were very sanctimonious about the fact that this is a different kind of campaign. We're draining the swamp. Anyone who has any experience in politics whatsoever is the swamp, and they're that awful. Is the irony. Swamp people don't get indicted on campaigns, okay? Mm -hmm. Because they know the w rules of politics and rules of how mm -hmm. to run campaigns. So excuse me right now, as a born swamp person, all of you are ending up in jail. The ones that you're so proud of draining the swamp yeah. with starting with Roger Stone on down. Yeah. Did she just characterize herself as a swamp person? Does does she realize that the so-called swamp refers to corrupt government employees who advance their own interests at the expense of the American people? Right, so she's characterizing herself as one of those. Okay. Megan, you realize that the swamp is considered to be a threat to democracy precisely because they don't get arrested. They're the powerful political operatives who are unjustly persecuting political opponents. They themselves understand the political system well. They are embedded and they have power Powerful friends who are also corrupt, also part of the swamp, who will help them cover their tracks and lie for them. This is the entire problem we have with the swamp. You can't proudly identify yourself as a swamp person unless you admit that you yourself are corrupt or that you're okay with corrupt members of government. You know, in my last two episodes of The View, I was on the fence about outright condemning Meghan McCain, but I think she's falling over the edge here. Endorsing the swamp is tantamount, in my view, to endorsing corruption. Although she's not a hard leftist, I haven't seen Meghan McCain say anything on this show that really defends conservatives or conservatism. She tends to cut down Trump and defend individuals that she likes. She never makes a case for conservative values, just people she likes. And that is exactly what the swamp is accused of doing. We don't use the power of government to persecute people we don't like and to protect people we do. That is called corruption. And Meghan McCain illustrates her willingness to engage in swamp-like favoritism and persecution every day on this show. So I can't see any way around it. Meghan McCain is not a conservative voice on this show. She is the voice of the political swamp, as she has stated. She must be condemned in equal measure as Crazy Whoopi Goldberg, Angry Witch Joy Behar, Cringy Anna Navarro, and the village idiot Sonny Hostin. I can no longer give Meghan's hostile statements the benefit of the doubt. She is the defender of the swamp, and her statements must be interpreted with that in mind. There's 800,000 federal workers. I I have uh, a suggestion for these federal workers since Donald Trump says that people will know them and will work with them. Mm -hmm. I think federal workers should show up at Trump properties, eat and eat yeah. and eat yeah. and eat, and then say to the people when they, the bill comes, you know, work with me. The president said he'd work with me. I'm here to That's eat for right. free and get room and board for free. At so Mar-a-Lago, they should work with them. Mar-a-Lago, Trump Doral in Miami, Trump DC. <laughs> Why don't you give me addresses? Yeah, yeah, well, I'll, I'll post expensive. all the addresses. White House serve. Cringy Anna Navarro always says crazy stuff like this. I used to watch her on Meet the Press, and this is her shtick. I remember when she used to be more on board with conservatives and would attack Democrats in this way. All the other conservatives on the panel would just kind of look down at their notes when she talked. It was like they were embarrassed to be in the same room with her. I don't think I've ever heard her express a strong original idea in her entire career. I think she benefited early in her career from being a female Latina conservative. And I think she became a favorite of left-wing political shows because she never presented any strong conservative ideas to defend the party. It was always this weak, emotion-driven, dramatic BS. And now she's fixed into this anti-Trump BS and she spouts as much leftist drivel as Whoopi or, or Behar. Navarro is definitely the one I hate the most of any of the women on this show. But Behar is a very close second. Colin, Colin has one line yeah. in there that was about me. He said, oh. and you, this you'll love. He goes, don't never trust a socialist with a summer house. That's me. <laughs> She said it to me yet, but she goes, I'm a socialist. This is I do so like good. that. Is it come clean day on The View today? Megan McCain's admitting to being a swamp person, and Joy Behar is admitting to being a socialist. <laughs> I mean, it's great in a way. It's, it's always good to have a foundation of honesty from which to debate, but these ladies are on national television in front of millions of ordinary Americans. You'd think they'd steer clear of endorsing corruption or extremist political ideologies. But I guess that's where we are today in America. Endorsing socialism and corruption are acceptable now. Wonderful. So, yeah, these five episodes were chock full of things to hate, which I think made this episode incredibly successful. <laughs> well, that's it for me. If you like this episode, hit the like button. If you want to see more like this, please subscribe. And if you hate me, that's what we call cognitive dissonance. That means you're learning.
Good night. President Washington began this tradition in 1790 after reminding the nation that the destiny of self-government is finally staked on the experiment entrusted to the hands of the American people. For our friends in the press who place a high premium on accuracy, let me say, I did not actually hear George Washington say that.